Welcome. My name is Linnea Austin Johnston with CTO, and I'm really excited to welcome you to today's um, Mentor Spotlight, uh, where we'll be discussing cultivating diversity in research, learnings from the sickle cell community. We have really um, excellent, well-experienced people here to talk to you about best practices in this space today. So for those of you who um, are less familiar with Research Ready and the Mentor Spotlight series. This is a CTO program that aims to share best practices and expertise from mentors in a particular topic area. And we hold it every month. This session is obviously available live where we hope to have maximum interaction from the audience, but it's also being recording and will be available on demand in the future. So if you find that this is something you'd like to share with your team or a colleague, it's available on our website um, at your disposal. For those of you who are collecting uh, continuing education credits, we do provide a certificate of attendance for live attendance. So to receive this, just simply stay on the call. Um, and once we end the session, there'll be a pop-up screen that asks you to complete a very short survey, one minute, um, but it'll give you the opportunity to put your information in and then we can send you uh, a live or attendance certificate. All right, so today I'm very excited to welcome two speakers who are going to hold kind of a fireside chat today. So a little bit different setup than some of our other calls. So Lanre Tunji Ajayi is the president and CEO of the Sickle Cell Awareness Group of Ontario and the founding president and CEO of the Sickle Cell Disease Association of Canada. She's also the co-founder and past president of the Global Alliance of Sickle Cell Disease Organizations. Lenre serves as the chair and board member for numerous organizations and has orchestrated groups focused on addressing disparity in care, equity, diversity, and inclusion. She has led and co-investigated research studies and has re received numerous awards, including most recently, the Meritorious Service Medal, which was conferred by the Governor General of Canada. So welcome, Len Ray. We're really excited to hear from you today. Thank um, you Dawn, Dawn is our good CTO colleague. She's also the founder of 502 Labs and the director of the patient and public engagement at CTO, where she is executing on the strategic pillar of patient and public engagement. As a patient advocate and volunteer, Dawn is Vice President of the Canadian Arthritis Patient Alliance, a research ambassador for the Institute of Musculoskeletal Health and Arthritis, and a member of the BMJ's patient panel reviewers. Dawn served as the first patient advisor of the Canadian Medical Association's Wait Time Alliance, and she advocates for arthritis awareness, access to treatment, the inclusion of patients in decision-making, and as research collaborators and the overall importance of research. So Don's gonna lead our conversation today and I'm gonna pass it over to you both now and thank you so much for being here. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Linnea. Um, we didn't plan this, but uh, as my Twitter feed is reminding me, it's actually International Women's Day and um, the hashtag is hashtag break the bias. So I'm going to be honest, um, there is no other person that I would rather have a one hour conversation with <laughs> um, other than Lanray today on International Women's Day. So uh, thanks everyone for taking an hour to join us. Um, before we get going, as Linnea mentioned, uh, we've just, we're just going to set up um, a a kind of informal conversation. I know we have a, a bunch of people listening in on us. Um, and what we'd like to do is encourage you, if you're not shy to raise your hand and ask questions. And if that's not your style today, which is totally fine, uh, please go ahead and use the chat and just post your questions in the chat. And Lanry and I uh, will be watching that and we can um, take your questions as we go along. So first of all, um, Lanry, Linnea did a really nice job of introducing you. And I wonder if you could um, start off by sharing with us some of what brought you to be involved with the Sickle Cell Awareness Group of Ontario, or you're gonna hear us call it SCOG go throughout uh, the next hour or so. So um, I know a lot about your motivations, but can you share that with the rest of the audience, Lanry, what you're comfortable with? 
Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I'd like to wish all women um, happy International Women's Day and to thank CTO for bringing me to this forum to talk about, you know, um, diversity in research and learning from sickle cell community. Um, again, what brought me to the space, um, sickle cell space? I was born in a family that um, was affected by sickle cell disease. And I lost my brother, who was my best friend, um, to sickle cell disease in 1999. It was almost 30 years old when he died. He was an accomplished engineer. He had a whole life ahead of him. He has done all we ask him to do, go to school, have education, yet to no fault of his, he had to succumb to complications of sickle cell disease at a very young age of 30 years old. Um, it wasn't until about five years after, in 2005, that I actually stepped out to say, I could also make a difference. And I felt a calling. Um, as you might know, in the sickle cell community, there's a lot of stigma around sickle cell disease all over the world, not just in Canada, but in, 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 in Africa, in India, Middle East, everywhere. And I was no different. I didn't want to have, you know, that part of my story out there, uh, but I felt this um, higher calling um, telling me I could do something about it. And that, that is really my story. And in 2005, I stepped out and started to raise awareness in churches, in community places, and that led to the formation of Sickle Cell Awareness Group of Ontario. So, Lanre, you touched a little bit about um, your own uh, experiences with sickle cell disease, and maybe for the folks who are part of the call today that aren't as familiar with sickle cell disease as you are, can you tell us a bit about this? I mean, I know it's an incurable disease, but if you can expand on that, and also who does it primarily affect? You've touched on stigma, and unfortunately, um, you know, that goes hand in hand with the, com the largest community that it affects, but maybe you can put that in your own words for the group. Thank you very much. Um, so sickle cell disease is the most common genetically inherited blood disorder in the world. So it affects every organ of your body and complications include things like, you know, episodic pain crisis that has been compared to um, terminal cancer pain, um, has been compared to be worse than child uh, labor. Um, it, it can cause blindness, um, damage to every organ of the body. So this is a very serious illness. And it predominantly affects people that identify as black. And I think that is part of the reason why for many years, especially in this part of the world, a lot of attention has not been given to the disease because it's been seen as a minority health issue. Those sickle cell also affect people from, you know, South Asia, like India, about 1.8 million people in India have sickle cell disease. But again, there's stigma, there's a lot of hush hush around it as well. Um, when you think about Europe, about 52,000 people have sickle cell disease in Europe. In USA alone, about 100,000 people have sickle cell disease. Um, you find that it's everywhere, right? Um, and sickle cell disease, even though it is, you know, endemic more to sub-Sahara Africa, whereby you have about 300,000 babies, um, sorry, about 150,000 babies born in Nigeria alone, one country in sub-Saharan Africa, and about 300,000 babies born all over the world every year. Um, you find that due to migration, sickle cell is now everywhere in the world. And so, but one thing is still common, like I mentioned, stigma is still common and discrimination 
and people are unwilling to talk about it because you find in some cultures, for instance, marriage is very important. And if you, you know, and, and, and people feel sometimes that if people know that they have sickle cell in their family, um, you know, they may not have people that want to marry into that family. So there's a lot of culture and things that also tie up into why people are not talking about sickle cell disease as they should. Okay, thanks, Lanray. And I think that um, also really leads into, you know, the importance of research for the sickle cell community. So some of the things I just heard you say are, it, it becomes a systemic disease, right? So um, your brother died from this. And um, I can imagine that uh, I, I don't know enough about it, Lanry, so forgive me for being ignorant, even though I work with you. Um, but basically, is, is the lifespan of the average person who lives with sickle cell also uh, less than it would be if they did not live with sickle cell disease? It is. Okay. Yes. Yes, it is. So um, individuals with sickle cell disease will have their lifestyle, the, their lifespan caught by about 25 to 30 years compared to their peers. I mean, thanks to more research now, there are innovative therapies um, that we are having now. Bone marrow transplantation is becoming more common now in sickle cell where people are getting cured. Uh, but again, it's not for everybody um, and so on. And when we talk about, I just wanna talk quickly about around stigma. Even in our own country here, when it comes to sickle cell disease in our healthcare system. So the healthcare system that's supposed to help you when you you're sick um, as largely stigmatized sickle cell disease. So I'll give you a quick example. Um, God help you. You are a male and you have sickle cell disease and you have dreadlocks or you cornrow your hair and you walk into the emergency and you see you are in pain, excruciating pain that if I'm in child labor, if I'm having a baby, if I say I'm having a baby, you will rush to me, you will help me. But if I have sickle cell disease and my pain is worse than a labor pain, most of the time they are dismissed as sickening drugs. They couldn't have sickle, they could, the pain couldn't be that bad, right? They're sickening drugs or they are delayed treatment. And because they are delayed treatment, you know what happens is that um, instead of them to spend maybe a week on admission, if they get admitted, they might end up spending weeks, two, three weeks, months, because they did not get the right care at the right time. What are we doing? We are wasting resources. We are wasting the bed space. We are wasting even the doctor's time, the nurse's time, because we are not attending to sickle cell patients on a timely manner. And this is systemic, it's there. The buyers are real. And many times I find that the healthcare providers have been buyers, not because they just want to be buyers, but because of lack of knowledge, enough knowledge around this disease. Education is important and understanding the cultures you know, around diseases is also important. A quick example again, when individuals with sickle cell disease are young, we have taught them to develop coping strategies around sickle cell disease. So when you pain and the pain is high, we are, we are comparing pain to terminal cancer. We were taught them to listen to music, things that will help you cope with this pain. And then they grow up learning and trying to cope with their pain. So forgive me if I have sickle cell and I'm not screaming at the top of my voice because I've learned to cope from a tender age with my pain. But then you look at me in the hospital system and you say, they can't be in that pain if they're in their full. I'm trying to help myself. So it's a to give them the right care at the right time. Thank you. Thanks, Lan Ray. You always so eloquently put into words um, just terrible situations, I'll be honest, right? It's very painful for me to hear about the treatment that members of the sickle cell of community have endured um, because 
you know, we've, we've made assumptions as a community about them that uh, how they handle their pain and have learned to cope and manage their pain um, is, you know, um, is given us assumptions about, oh, you're not really in pain or simply because you look different from me uh, must mean that, uh, you know, you're seeking drugs or something else. So this makes me inherently sad to hear this and really, really grateful that you go out of your way to share these experiences from your community. And I know some of your own um, that you've seen people experience as well and, and share this with the community. So uh, I just want to say how grateful I am that you do this because I know that it's not easy. Um, and it's you just feel the calling, as you mentioned, that this is so important for this community and others to hear about. So I, I just wanted to reinforce how grateful I am that you're here sharing this with us today. Um, so you, you started talking about this land, Ray, and you know, racism is unfortunately something that we have to recognize that's part of our healthcare system. And it can be part of our research system as well. We shouldn't shy away from that during this discussion. And I apologize if it makes people uncomfortable. To me, that's part of growing, is hearing um, you know, what we're talking about today and knowing that each of us can make a difference um, in what people experience. So you touched on this a bit. I mean, I'm gonna be stupid if I don't understand that there are ingrained reasons why some members of your community don't trust the healthcare community and the research community. But you know, I'm going to ask you, Lan Ray, to share with us some more of those. And, you know, most recently you've talked to us about some of what you've heard, for example, with respect to COVID-19 vaccines and how you've been trying to combat that misinformation within your community. So um, hopefully you'll be willing to take a few minutes and share with the group explicitly, you know, so that they can understand where your community is coming from with respect to mistrust. Thank you, Don, for that question. Um, so I would say that in 1932, around that time, there was, a, there was the Tuskegee syphilis study um, whereby Negroes um, were used as subjects. Um, there was an ethical use of black males and that has a lasting impact on the black community. Even though this happened in the USA, it didn't happen in Canada, it didn't happen in England, um, it has a lasting impact on blacks all over the world. Many are skeptical that when there's research out there, they don't want to be uh, part of it because they don't want to be the guinea pigs. They mm -hmm. don't want to be used in research. Um, when the drugs are out there, we can take it when everybody's using it, but we're not going to be the subjects of the, of the studies. And even with the COVID-19, so we've done a lot of work over the years to kind of help people understand that uh, they have a right. Things are changed. Things are different. There are guidelines, there are protocols that start that researchers have to follow and those things cannot happen anymore. And you also have a right to, you know, join or leave a study if you don't think it aligns with your values, your priorities and so on. So that has helped over the years. However, come COVID-19, and then the vaccination, and then it came back mm. again. And people mm -hmm. are saying, um, okay, this is a way to get rid of black people. We have videos that are going that people are recording videos and people are saying, well, some of the people who are actually recording the videos are not black. And they're saying, black people beware, this is to wipe your generations out. So it becomes very difficult for us. And then it's like we went back again 15 years ago to right. start to say, 
no, this is not true. This is a myth, it's not a fact. And what we had to do then was to start to do educational sessions to help people decipher the facts from the myths and to say, that is a lie, it could never be. And if it's to wipe the blacks, then why are they giving everybody? It's, only the, it's not only the blacks, but it took a lot of time, a lot of work for people to start to come around again and start to trust. And, I, and as you might also know, we just got a funding from the Public Health Agency of Canada. Mm -hmm. and, it, and this is also to do our work around COVID-19 and vaccination in the Black and the sickle cell disease community. A component of that project was, is a research study um, titled um, Vaccine Hesitancy in the Sickle Cell and Black Community at the intersection of race and disease. So with this study, we are open to better understand, not just, I mean, we've done surveys, but we want to go in depth and have focus groups and, and better understand how we can really help our community in overcoming the ills, the, you know, the effects of the ills that has been done to the black community when it comes to unethical use of this cohort in clinical trials in the past. And I just wanted to congratulate um, Scago again, Lanray, on the PHAC funding. Just, just so that people on the call have a sense, Scago is primarily run by volunteers. You're, I think maybe you get a small honorarium, Lanray, but you know, you're making pennies on the hour because I know all of the work that you put in to what you do. And the PHAC funding is, um, you know, it's, it's a large amount of funding that you've been recognized to do uh, research with. So I, I really want to congratulate you for, for that, that effort. Um, I think, you know, I think you and I met almost six years ago, if I'm not mistaken, when you and a colleague of yours actually reached out to Clinical Trials Ontario. Um, so you came knocking on our door to say, you know, what can we do together? How can you help with our community? And I've been privileged to be part of a number of conferences you've hosted, a number of webinars you've hosted. Um, I've also seen recently, you know, you have um, hosted um, vaccination centers also, if I'm not mistaken, at at sick kids, and you've arranged um, to get people to those things. What else can you tell this group specifically about some of the educational work you've undertaken, and also um, not just with your community members, but you like you've engaged Clinical Trials Ontario. I know you've worked to engage investigators, sponsors. Like you're leaving nobody out of this community. So, can you share with us a bit more about what you've done? Thank you so much, Dan. And I want to say that, I mean, thank you also for the congratulatory messages. Um, you know, I wanted to say that if we must have a cure, it starts with clinical trials. And if we have a community who is very skeptical about clinical trials, we've got to do something. And that's why we reach out to Clinical Trials Ontario uh, about, I think about maybe seven, six, seven years ago to say, how do we work together? And over the years we have worked together, we are able to now have on our website, all the clinical trials that are happening in the space of sickle cell disease in Canada and in, and in Ontario to help our families know what is out there, what they can, be part of. We have linked our, our, our research um, uh, page to clinical trial, Ontario's page and vice versa as well, to help people, you know, have easy access to both sides. Um, also, you know, as part of what we've done, education, education, um, helping people answering their questions, no question is stupid. We have brought you down and many people from the research community onto different webinars to kind of help educate and, you know, um, interact, engage our community. And that has all helped. It has all helped, you know, in what we're doing, what, you know, and what we have been able to, you know, also um, achieved as a community. Um, you know, and I think for us, we want to be able to get our families with sickle cell disease to have better interest 
in, in clinical trials, in research, to participate, to have their voices there, to be an equal partner at the research tables is very important. We want to make sure that people do not think that they're subjects. They do not think that we are participants. We are just participating. No, we are a team. We are part of the research team. We are equal. We are part of the governance. We are part of every aspect of the research. So this is the work that we are doing, you know, around, you know, research. Um, as an organization, a patient group, not only are we also supporting things like fellowship programs in hospitals, we are also conducting our own psychosocial research. We wanted to know more about, you know, what is, what is it that our patients want and what is it that they do not appreciate and how do we bring that to the researchers, the sponsors and help them understand that. And I think most recently, uh, done Clinical Trials Ontario um, in partnership with SCAGO and the Ontario Hospitals um, Research Institute, I believe we are um, doing uh, a collaborative work thanks to CTO, um, whereby we are also looking at what are the perceptions, right, of people from the sickle cell community uh, around clinical trials in research. I think all of these studies are very important and it will help the industry partners, it will help you know, the investigators, it will help every one of us who are open to advanced care for people, not only with sickle cell, but also in the larger community, because the more you understand one particular um, um, sector of the community, you can take some of those knowledge and you can use them in understanding other parts of the community as well. Thanks, Lan Ray. We're really aligned. I mean, you know this, but I'll let the rest of the group know this. You're really aligned in how we think about um, engaging patients and their caregivers. We, we always say at CTO with clinical trials. So not only as participants, if they make that decision for themselves, but also as uh, you said so nicely, equal partners on the research team. So, you know, that's a big goal of ours that CTO is providing people with the tools. So A, they can make an informed decision if they'd like to participate in a clinical trial or not, and B, to help uh, research team sponsors, et cetera, include patients and caregivers as partners on the team, because we feel that that will build uh, better um, clinical trials for specific communities. Um, also, just building on what Lan Ray mentioned, um, we are working with um, SCOGO and the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute under uh, Dr. Jamie Brehout's um, leadership, where we are um, doing a research project and we will be issuing a, a survey to SCOGO's community to better understand, as Lan Ray said, these facilitators and barriers related to clinical trials. And as we've done with other groups, that will be a formal publication, but there will be lots of other things that come out of that as well so that we can start to understand uh, what, what works for specific communities and, and what doesn't work in terms of our system for those communities. Kind of along those lines, Lan, we, we have a question that's come in about you know, given what you know from your community about um, their fear and hesitance, some of them with respect to research for very valid reasons, historical reasons, um, what do you think uh, or what advice could you give research coordinators and investigators with respect to their interactions with potential participants? For example, either during the informed consent process or or simply approaching them about potential research. Any advice you have for people? Thank you, Don. So I would say number one, um, you have to engage them from the beginning. Engage them from the beginning, not as hard on later on. So what do I mean by that? They need to be part of the whole process, um, what is being done, help them understand, educate them provide them with, you know, expectations, the roles, their rights, the, you know, and let them understand your values, your priorities around the study as well. It's very important. And you also have to use cultural lens 
in what you're doing. Um, I, you know, it's not one size fits all. I'm sorry. Um, so for instance, I'll tell you in some cultures, and I've used this example a lot, in some cultures, um, you find that um, having a male, a, a spouse present when a woman is given birth is the norm, like in Canadian culture. Um, but in some culture, it's frowned upon and, and have been a part of I've been I've been a part of a situation whereby a cup a, a care provider was actually assuming that by this spouse not being present when their wife was given birth um, that maybe the spouse was not supportive enough, but it's a different culture and that applies across care it applies across research yeah, across across the spectrum we have to look at the cultures of the people that we are supporting or that we are doing research with and for and so we have to kind of look at for instance somebody who's been taught all their life that teamwork is valuable and then if they place in a situation whereby they now have to receive incentives for our solo efforts they find it difficult. So you have to look at the culture. You have to put that cultural lens on to be better able to reflect the people that you're willing, that you're, you know, um, trying to help in what you're doing. So like I mentioned, engaging them from the get-go, let them be part of governance, let, they, let their voice be there. The patient's voice is important. And not only that, there should be diversity, inclusion. Um, I find that when I talk about inclusion, I find it unsettling for me. And I understand business aspect of research as well, whereby researchers um, are looking at, investigators are looking at, um, okay, maybe for instance, I'm going to use sickle cell as an example, most of the clinical trials in sickle cell are happening in North America, in Europe. Yet, we have the most number of affected in Sub-Saharan Africa. Why is nothing happening there? Why are we not have clinical trials and research there? Yes, I understand there are barriers that, you know, um, sponsors and researchers might be facing in those parts of the world, but we can work together to overcome that and include those parts of the world. We have to recognize the world as a global village and we need to start to include the groups that are actually involved. How do we research, you know, sickle cell and focus on, you know, in a country that has 6,000 people when you have under 150,000 babies born in, one, in, in another country every year, and we're doing nothing there. I'm not saying don't do things in Canada. I'm not saying don't do things in US or in UK, but I'm saying let's be inclusive and also include other parts of the world. Let's include India in what we're doing. And let's be more, you know, let, I, I would really like to see, uh, you know, an environment that is more inclusive in research globally, globally. And, and, and that is my advice, um, you know, to the, to the uh, research community, not just for sickle cell, but also for even for other, you know, disorders, include the global community. And let's not just focus on the US and the UK and those parts of the world alone. We need to be more inclusive in research. Hey, so, and you know, what I heard from you there, Alain Ray, is you're you fully recognize that there are potential barriers, but you feel so strongly about the inclusion of working with people who live in this case um, with sickle cell disease, that there are ways to overcome barriers or, or maybe they're perceived barriers. Like I'll just be honest with you, right? Um, so are they really barriers or are, are we creating barriers where there, there really aren't because we haven't tried to cooperate and to work fully globally. So um, I think that's really excellent food for thought for the group. Um, so, and, and maybe we could just go back a little bit, Lanry, because you, you talk about applying a culture, a cultural lens in both care and research. Um, and I mean, I, one part of what I heard there is like, basically know your community, like know who 
the research is intended to be for and who you're going to be asked to be participating in the research. Is there anything else, though, that you want to kind of draw out uh, of what you mean by cultural lens in care and research? Uh, thank you. So I also wanted to, so I think what, one thing I could also add um, is just the way we relate to people um, as well is very important. Um, the values, you know, the, 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 you know, part of the cultural, applying the cultural lens is also to better understand what are the values of your community. Um, so we, we're doing a research around sickle cell disease. We're trying to bring a new innovative therapy into you know, you know, into the pipeline, engage the community from the get-go, know their values. Um, a researcher's value could be around, um, for instance, um, you're creating this innovative therapy that maybe could improve the median age of survivor for individuals with sickle cell disease, let's say from 45, maybe to 55. Maybe the values, maybe a priority for the sickle cell community could be they just want to have not just prolonged life, but improved quality of life. So there has to be alignment and that is important. And without you having discussions with them, you don't know what is really their priority. Maybe it's not just having a prolonged life. Maybe it's just, maybe it's more having a better quality of life. I receive, I mean, it's not every time and thank God for that. Uh, but I do receive once in a while emails from people with sickle cell who are frustrated with life. And they're like, I don't want to be here anymore. Mm. So maybe prolonged life is not so much. Maybe it is quality of life that we're talking about here. And so we have to have our priorities align, the patient community and the research community. If we're not aligned, then we're not working. The left hand doesn't really align with the right hand. We're not working in zinc. And then we're not working to better um, improve and help the people that we thought we are helping because we don't know what really they're looking for, right? So I think applying cultural lens will help to bring it all together in helping us better understand the people, their culture, their values, what is important to them, what they would like to see happen in research versus what we think should happen or should be you know, out there, right? So that, there needs to be that opportunity to have that happen. Yeah, I think that's so important, Lan Ray. I, I know living with arthritis, I always, try and say, you know, like my rheumatologist is amazing, right? Medical expert, like hands down, um, but they don't live with what I live with day to day. Now, my arthritis is not sickle cell disease, but I can imagine that there are some parallels there that, you know, when you're, when you're living with a condition, you're trying to manage it, you're trying to deal with it every day, uh, your, your perception around what is really important and, you know, where you want to see research done could be very different from someone who, yes, well, they've devoted their career uh, treating a specific community, uh, they simply don't live in your shoes. And so I'm not knocking what, you know, uh, physicians and researchers see as important, and I know you're not either. The point, though, is just, you know, when you live with something or when you care for someone who lives with a condition, they... The, the way you view the world and the way that you view that condition and research priorities is going to be very different. So I love that point about talk to the community and find out what's really important for them. And, and that may not match where you think you need to be doing research and that's okay, um, but you're gonna learn new things that hopefully strengthen what your research questions are and ultimately your outcomes and how um, the community will, um, We'll look at your research and your findings, right? Exactly. And, and, I, and I wanted to add that even as an organization, the SCAGO um, created about three years ago, two to three years ago, a patient adversary and advocacy council. Yes, we are the patients. Yes, we are the, we are the, um, the advocates, but we still felt the need to put a team of people together with lived sickle cell experience 
who can better even seal advisors on what we are doing. Are we serving them? Or are we now kind of going on and doing our own thing because we mm-hmm. get kind of get used to what we're doing and we're just doing our own thing. So I think it's the same lens. We have to look at everything we're doing. The people who are affected needs to be equal at the table and their voices must ring loud to say, we've heard from you. This is what you want. This is the priorities. This is your values. And we will work to make that happen. And sometimes I mean, there may be opportunity to have a consensus and come in the middle. That's fine too. But getting the voices heard, I think is very important. Thank you. And I've, I've heard you say too, Len, where you talked about the ownership of research and feeling like being part of the research team or um, you know, connected to the research when you were part of identifying research uh, priorities and needs. Could you just talk a little bit about that for, for the audience too? Yes, thank you. So I always, I'm a strong advocate for being equal at the table. Um, mm-hmm. I think as patient organizations, um, we don't want um, um, researchers to come to us when the work is already started and they are saying, okay, yeah, we want to hear from you. This is what we've done. What do you think? No, we want to be there from the get-go. If you're researching into sickle cell and you need to engage the sickle cell community from the get-go, um, we find some of this, uh, some of the industry partners are listening, but we still know there's a lot that still needs to be done to make this be where it needs to be. Um, in, we need to be part of governance, and 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 I know recently we um, we just um, we we are also working on a study with um, you know um, University Health Network or a shark uh, grant application okay. that we submitted around individuals that are fifty plus living with sickle cell disease just to. We would like to know more about them, about because again, as you know, for the for the longest time, sickle cell is pediatric. People are not mm-hmm. living long with sickle cell, but things are changing. People are living longer with sickle cell. We need to look at, you know, sickle cell people who are fifty plus with sickle cell disease at the intersection of race, you know, chronic disease and age, and so. We are working with UHN, we are working with many partners, but again, we are equal partners. We are researching this together as equal partners. We are not just being added on as, okay, yeah, let's just have one patient there and, and that will make everybody happy. No, we're part of governance, we're part of directions, setting the priorities, the timelines, every part of it. And that is how things need to start to move. We need to be part of the whole process as patients, right? And that is when we know that there is equality, there's diversity, there's inclusion in research. So it's really interesting, Lanry, because even within your own community, you're talking about the diversity of participants within uh, the sickle cell community, right? That many of the studies are done in pediatric populations, but now through this um, SHRC grant with your collaborators at UHN, you're starting to look at an older population of people who are living with sickle cell thanks to, thanks to medicine, I guess. So that's, that's really fascinating within your own community. You're, you're looking at the whole range of, and I know you do lots of work also with families and caregivers. So, so I know we've just converted the whole audience into thinking they have to work now with patient organizations <laughs> and health charities, right? Like that's the utopia you and I are living in. So, um, you know, there's often people are like, yeah, well, I'd love to do this, but I have no idea where to start. So Lanray, you are the perfect uh, person to help the group understand, do, do they come to you? What advice do you have to them? about you know if if they'd like to start working in this area or if they'd simply like to start having conversations with patients and caregivers it might not be scago you know it might be for a different condition but i know you've got all kinds of great advice based on your own experiences what do you what do you say to this audience thank you very much so my advice to you know investigators number one is apart from number one apart from the patient community um, you need to also engage um, family doctors, right? General practitioners, because they need to be part of the diversity in research. 
it's not every patient that has a specialist. I noticed that many of the research sites are in hospitals, right? Um, but the thing is, I'm talking about clinical trials now. Um, you need to engage the family doctors. Many people have family doctors, but they may not even go to their specialist um, in the um, hospitals like that. So engaging the family doctors is very important as well as part of the team because they can help to recruit and they should be part of the, uh, you know, the, you know, that diversity we're talking about and the governance and everything. They, their input is also very, very, very cogent. Now in terms of the patient organizations and the patient community, um, like you said, Don, um, patients and patients and their families can be engaged. Um, true, number one, you can engage them through patient organizations. I find that those that are very um, connected with patient organizations are usually very interested in what is going on, what is mm -hmm. happening. And this is why they join a patient group. They want to make a difference. They want to be part of the difference. And so through patient organizations, you can attract these um, patients and they can be part of what you're doing. And I think when you're approaching them, when you're coming to them, let them understand that you are coming to them from a place of equity and equality, whereby you understand their space and you also want to extend and hand to them for them to be able to also participate, you know, um, at their, you know, comfort level, but as equals. And so, because sometimes, like you said, Don, many of the patient groups could be, except for the big ones, <laughs> you know, not in terms of population affected, but in terms of funding, like hemophilia, cystic fibrosis, they have different trajectories in terms of funding for research and for stuff like that. But small organizations um, or maybe rare diseases may not have a lot of capacity for some things. So, you know, so equality and equity has to play a role here and let them help you understand the, their, their capacity and how they can be involved. So I would say that would be a way to approach the patient organizations and get their patients involved in, you know, in what you're doing as investigators. Okay, I think that's great advice. And I can also let the group know that uh, if you're shy, if you're not sure what that looks like, uh, honestly, I'm happy to work with uh, any investigators, research coordinators, anyone in the research space who, um, like I said, is a little bit shy, doesn't have connections. Um, we do a lot of work at CTO with organizations like LAN, RAISE and others. So um, I'm happy to help make those connections. Also, if you're just kind of dipping your toes into gaining patient insights, et cetera, um, CTO does have our College of Lived Experience, and that is a group of people that live with many different conditions. There's also caregivers there, and we can always get them together and, and help you brainstorm some things or to have a conversation there. So, Lanry, we've got a couple of questions coming in from the chat, too. Um, one of the questions is, um, if a research team can't affect things like the study design and governance, so for example, maybe it's a, a global study where that's already been set, um, what can the, the team more locally do and when should they start doing it? So, like we talked a little bit about hey, don't bring patients and patient organizations in after you've got this all cooked up, right? It's way better to bring them in early. But, but what if in this case, their hands are like a little bit tied because you know they're downstream from where the protocol was set, the, the governance team. What advice do you have for people? Is it still a good idea to, to have conversations with patients or would you say, would your advice be don't go there? I would say it's always a good idea to work with patients. And I always talk about, we can learn from others as well. So if a, if a research team is having challenges in an area, we can look at, for instance, um, other disease areas, how they've been able to overcome similar challenges, I mean, similar barriers and learn from them, right? Um, I am not ashamed to say that I, I defer to hemophilia many times to say, 
uh, hey, Immophilia, you guys are doing great work here. Um, you know, share with me, you know, how you've been able to have, uh, uh, overcome this barrier and get over this. And they're very wonderful people at Immophilia. And they never, never once said no to me. Um, it's always, memory, yes, let's support. We are all inherited blood disorders. We were working together. There is the need for cross disease collaboration as well. So investigators can look at Okay, so my team, we having this issue, what has been done in other areas and how have they been able to overcome those barriers? And they can use those lessons to also help them overcome uh, you know, those barriers in as much as possible. Um, and, and that would be uh, my advice. Okay, awesome. So just to reiterate, Lan Ray saying she still wants to hear from you, even if there's some things you can't change because there's always room and there's, there's always ways to learn and work uh, together. Um, another question we have, Lan Ray, is, you know, we, we've been talking a lot about in the work we do, how um, especially COVID has um, made this change towards decentralized clinical trials or hybrid clinical trials where people don't necessarily have to go to a central site. Um, but speaking to barriers, we found ways to, um, you know, bring things closer to home for people. What are your thoughts around this so-called decentralized approach? And do you see that potentially as um, maybe it's contributing to equity around bringing clinical trials to people? Maybe it's contributing to um, having more diverse populations participate. What, what are your thoughts around that? I think it's great. And I think COVID-19, as terrible as it is, has taught us new ways of doing things. And I think bringing you know, research closer to homes for people, it's convenience. Um, I know sometimes barrier could be traveling down to sites um, and so on and so forth. So having, having it closer to home, having opportunity for virtual opportunity as well sometimes, um, I think is helping and definitely contributing to equity and engaging more people and having more people also interested in wanting to be part of and participate in studies. So I think, in my mind, I think honestly is the way of the future and it is here, that future is here, um, whereby, you know, we can look at hybrid, you know, in most of the things that we do. It brings a lot of, um, you know, opportunity to reach more people, have more people participate and stay longer, <laughs> you know, not dropping off, you know, you know, in studies as well. So I think it's an excellent, personally, I think it's an excellent, excellent uh, um, um, system. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, one question that we we haven't chatted about, and you know, I'm cognizant we've only got a few minutes here, Landry, but I I did want to ask you about it. It's you know why what would you like to impart on this group about generally the importance to consider the diversity of participants in clinical trials? What kind of messages for you, do you have for them about um, diversity and and why that's important? So. Um... Even for disease that predominantly affect one group, um, you find that everyone is affected. It doesn't matter if it mainly affects Blacks or mainly affects people from South Asia or wherever, everyone is affected in the community, be it you know, the care providers, the researchers, the different community groups are affected. So then it does make sense then to have diversity, to have inclusion, to have different people included in the study and not to just focus. And if we're including everyone in the study, we also then must include everyone in the governance, you know, in every part of it as well. So it is then become a well-robust, well-rounded study that we're doing. When you have diversity, you having um, inputs from different categories, different types of people, different you know, uh, backgrounds, and that bring a lot of uh, credibility also to your study. So diversity is important. We can't just focus on one group or, you know, uh, uh, um, I find for instance, a lot of even diabetes research study, blacks are not, a lot, a lot of black people mm -hmm. are not participating. And yet blacks are very highly affected by diabetes. So how do we engage this 
Blacks, you know, the Black community, these individuals to be part of, you know, studies, right? So it's about engagement. It's about reaching out to the right organizations, the patient groups, and so on and so forth. And I think so diversity is important. If we must get a well, uh, um, um, a well uh, documented, a strong uh, um, um, data, you know, on the study that we are working on. So diversity, inclusion, equity, equality, they all the components that must be considered, they all part of that puzzle that will make a study what it's supposed to be. It's important. Okay. Okay, we're coming to the top of the hour here, Lanray. So this is your lightning round to let people know, well, anything else you'd like to leave them with about your work, the sickle cell community, anything we've talked about equity and diversity here, uh, this is your moment. Thank you very much. Um, one thing I'm going to say is that uh, as, as based on the discussions I have had today with Don, and thank you, Don, for the wonderful questions you've asked me, it's very apparent that um, the Black community, the sickle cell disease community, have endured a lot when it comes to unethical use of, um, you know, of this community in research, has research subjects. Part of that is, has brought a lot of psychosocial uh, you know, and psychological impact on this community. Sickle cell disease, we've talked a lot about the clinical aspects, the complications and the pain and everything. But we find that the mental health aspect of this disease has also been neglected. Mm -hmm. We have declared in our organization this year as a year of mental health in sickle cell disease. And please, I'm gonna ask you to follow us, um, you know, on our social media, um, you know, uh, on our social media, on Facebook, on Twitter, and, you know, and, and, you know, all of those social media, you'll be seeing a lot around mental health and sickle cell disease, because people with sickle cell disease, they're very resilient. And many times they've learned to cope, you know, with this disease, but it doesn't mean that they are not suffering. It doesn't mean that they don't have needs. And so we are focusing this year, yes, on clinical trials, on research, and but also on mental health. So um, that is what we will be doing. And one of the things that we are, we are hoping to do is to ensure that in this province, we have a mental health and support hub for sickle cell disease to support Ontario citizens living with sickle cell disease. So we are, we are hopeful through Clinical Trials Ontario, you will learn more about what we're doing and we're hopeful you can follow us and tag along and, you know, and be part of you know, the work we're doing to improve the lives of individuals and families that are affected by sickle cell disease in Ontario and in Canada. Thank you. Thanks, Lan Ray. I think that's a beautiful way to end things that, you know, your organization has identified the importance of mental health and um, that you're going to be focusing on that. So again, I, I really want to thank you. I'm so grateful that I, that I met you all those years ago. And uh, we just spent a wonderful hour. And I'd like you, I'd like to thank you for sharing everything that you have with us. I think we've learned a great deal. So I'm going to pass it back to Linnea to wrap up for us. Thank you, ladies, so much. That was um, very inspiring and empowering. So it gave us a lot to be inspired to um, reach toward, but you gave us a lot of great tips on how we can get there too, which is so important to this research ready community. Thanks for sharing your story with us and your best practices on um, doing better in all aspects of research toward the end of better diversity in our trials. So thanks, Lanry, and thank you, Don, for leading this discussion. Thank you all for being here today and sharing um, the hour with us. Again, just a reminder that there is a survey if you stay on, and we'd love to hear from you in terms of what you'd like to hear more of, um, and also, uh, you know, how we can make this more valuable to you as well. So thank you all. Have a great thank day. And you. again, happy International Women's Day to the women on the call. Thank you so Thanks. much for having me. Thank you everyone for listening. Thank you. Bye. Bye thank you.